Welcome to this presentation on academic freedom and the Catholic University. I'd like to begin by quoting the Vatican expert John Allen. In 2008, he explained the plans of Pope Benedict for visiting the United States. John Allen said this, and I quote, I think Benedict's diagnosis is that people are far too familiar with what the Catholic Church is against, rather than what it's for. People know far more about what the Catholic Church says no to, rather than what it says yes to. And so I think his effort is to try to present a positive vision of what the Catholic Church represents. Taking some inspiration from Pope Benedict, it's in that spirit that today I want to focus mostly on what the Church says yes to with regard to academic freedom. It's ultimately about a freedom of people at universities to teach, learn and research for the sake of truth and the common good. So in this presentation, I'm going to consider the Church's yes and share why I feel I have more academic freedom at a Catholic institution than I would at many other universities around the world. But instead of beginning with academic freedom itself, I want to say something about challenges to truth. Perhaps what I'm going to do in this presentation is to contrast what the Church says yes to with what so many in the world today say no to. At the beginning of his essay of truth, Francis Bacon called to mind the story of Jesus before Pilate, and he said this, What is truth? said jesting Pilate, and would not stay for an answer. In the New Testament, Pilate's question was a response to the statement of Jesus that he himself had come to testify to the truth. Bacon, however, thought that Pilate's contempt was not only an issue for biblical times, he complained that the people of the early 1600s also were not too enthusiastic about the truth. Bacon thought that they found the pursuit of truth too difficult, too laborious, and that they had what he called a natural though corrupt love of the lie itself. He concluded his essay by highlighting what he called the wickedness of falsehood, a wickedness that plagued his generation, and he reminded the reader that when Christ comes, he shall not find faith upon the earth. That was in 1625. In 1909, W.F.C. Wigston commented on Bacon and pointed out that the rejection of truth can come not just through intellectual laziness, but also through the repression of free speech, by the claim of offence, or by repressing questions for the sake of an unchallenged orthodoxy. Skipping forward over a hundred years, I would suggest that this is exactly what is happening in our world today, especially, sadly, on many university campuses. And so when I think about academic freedom, I think there is a connection between academic freedom and the proclamation of truth. We would be familiar with movements or trends today that work against academic freedom and truth. They include political correctness, something that stifles truth in favour of predetermined ideologies. So-called safe spaces and what is called a culture of vindictive protectiveness by Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt. They speak about this vindictive protectiveness in their article and their later book, The Coddling of the American Mind. Their work is worth reading for a number of reasons, one of which is their conclusion that the vindictive protectiveness that grounds safe spaces actually teaches college students to think pathologically 
instead of critically. Sadly, we even see today on campuses violence against ideas and violence against the people who hold and proclaim those ideas. Off campus, radical fundamentalism is another thing that works against freedom and truth. We see fundamentalism in different religions. And what is common to these fundamentalisms is a denial of the human capacity to know truth. The way I'd put this point, and I speak about this in, in other presentations, is that fundamentalists may have faith in God, but they have little to no faith in humanity. They emphasize human depravity, and they reject our ability to think rationally, to reason out questions, and to know truth for ourselves. You may think of other challenges to truth and academic freedom today. It is in that context that I want to consider talk about academic freedom in the Catholic University. One question is whether academic freedom is a negative thing or a positive thing in a Catholic University. Is it a yes or no? And too often it is discussed in the context of what one can't do. But I would argue, and I think this is most important, in addition to what we could call the boundaries of freedom, it's also important to talk about the positive, to focus on what we can do. Indeed, as academics at Catholic universities, we should argue and hold to what academic freedom says we must do as a vocation in a Catholic university. Taking an historical perspective on academic freedom, I think that academic freedom is something that we see in the intellectual DNA of a Catholic university. It's not an imposition upon Catholic universities. It's actually a positive freeing up of scholars to teach and research in truth, for truth, and for the common good. It's a freedom from interference by governments or other groups. To put the point in other words, in the minds of many people, being at a Catholic university constricts academic freedom. However, I think that the nature of academic freedom at a Catholic university is, in fact, an academic freedom which is protected and nurtured by a Catholic university because that's what we are, that is our vocation specifically as a Catholic university. Let's turn to Ex Corde Ecclesiae. In paragraph 29, Pope John Paul II affirms that human culture and the sciences have their own autonomy. He no doubt when he wrote this had in mind that the Galileo case where the autonomy of the sciences was, was not respected. In that light, John Paul means that scholars in their own disciplines should enjoy the academic freedom that is proper to their disciplines and also the freedom proper to the methods of those disciplines. However, the Pope clarifies that such academic freedom should exist, and I quote, within the confines of the truth and the common good. That's very important. Academic freedom does have its boundaries, if you like, but it also has an object, an aim, and a purpose. The purpose of academic freedom is for truth and for the common good. In other words, academic freedom is not something that exists in a vacuum. It has an object. It has an end. Now, at a practical level, Pope John Paul means that scholars within a university community should enjoy full academic freedom, so long as their teaching and research don't conflict with Catholic faith and values, or work against the common human good. Now, it can be taken for granted. This means that at a Catholic university, we don't do pro-abortion teaching or pro-abortion research. It also means that we would not, at a Catholic university, do research for producing chemical weapons or, or take on business studies 
that promote the unjust exploitation of workers. At an institutional level, we have core Catholic values that um, put a, a boundary, if you like, on the sorts of things that individuals would do within that community. Now, at a theoretical level, John Paul's statement on freedom makes sense within the context of his other writings on freedom in, in general. There's a problem in our world today. Freedom is often confused with licentiousness or moral anarchy or things like that. What is freedom in the Catholic tradition? John Paul II follows the Second Vatican Council and he connects freedom, truth and human dignity. In that light, the discussion of academic freedom turns away from the, the, the superficial questions of what we can or can't do to deeper questions of what we should do. Questions of what our vocation to truth and freedom are in a Catholic university. So to put the point in other terms, academic freedom in the Catholic university is only at a superficial level about the things that we can't say or do. At a deeper level, academic freedom is a vocation to the free and relentless pursuit of truth and the common good. From another perspective, what John Paul II says about academic freedom correlates with an important principle. That is, when people have rights, they have accompanying responsibilities. So to put John Paul into other words, academic freedom should always be accompanied by academic responsibility. But coming back to freedom, what does John Paul mean by freedom? He basically means what Vatican II meant by freedom. Now a Catholic concept of freedom is taught in Vatican II's Dignitatis Humanae. Freedom there is defined as immunity from coercion. True freedom is being unfettered by pressure to act against one's convictions. This is very important in the Jewish Christian tradition because that freedom comes from the, the idea that human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. We see this in the first chapter of Genesis. Now human dignity demands that we share in God's freedom, that we act according to our own convictions and not because of external coercion. The idea of freedom that Vatican II and John Paul II talk about is brought out very well by St. Paul in his letter to the Romans. He wrote at a time when people said, well, we are free, we can do whatever we like. But Paul clarified the meaning of freedom this way. Are we free to sin now that we are not under law, but grace? Out of the question, he says. For Paul, freedom was not liberty to sin, but instead freedom from enslavement to sin. Paul writes that before experiencing the grace of Christ, people were not free to live out their lives as images of God, but instead that they were slaves to sin. He also notes that when the Christians were pagans, they were, as he said, enslaved to things that are not really God's at all. Now, however, that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, he asks, how can you turn your back again to the weak and beggarly elemental spirits? Accordingly, if we capture Christi Christian freedom in one sentence, we can say that Paul's idea of freedom is not freedom to do anything you like, but freedom from external forces. It's the freedom to be who you truly are without enslavement or external coercion. This idea clarifies the notions of true freedom and abused freedom. Putting my words into Paul's mouth, true freedom is freedom in truth. 
Good freedom is freedom in goodness. So if we translate St. Paul into the context of academic freedom, academic freedom is not freedom from truth. Instead, it is freedom from lies, freedom from coercion, freedom from those things that steer us away from truth and goodness. Inspired by this reality, Pope John Paul II clarifies that true freedom is freedom in truth. Now if we take the premise that in God we find all truth and goodness, then, as Pope John Paul notes in Veritatis Splendor, genuine freedom is an outstanding manifestation of the divine image in man. Genuine freedom then, a freedom that is true and good, is freedom that is dedicated to the pursuit of truth and goodness. It's not a freedom that ignores truth, nor is it a freedom that ignores human values. But as the Pope notes in Veritatis Splendor, it is always freedom in the truth. Freedom can unfortunately be abused freedom. This is when one exercises freedom with disregard for truth or goodness. More specifically, freedom is abused when we reject God, who is truth and goodness itself. So for Pope John Paul II, academic freedom at a Catholic university is not freedom from the truth, but freedom for the truth and in the truth. The same goes for Catholic values. Academic freedom at a Catholic university must never be free from authentic human values, but it's always a freedom for promoting and upholding human values and what we call the common good. So the vision of academic freedom I've spoken about makes freedom a positive value at a Catholic university and not a burden. The positive value of, of academic freedom leads to another point. And this is something that Catholic universities have as a vocation. That is to be guardians of academic freedom against domination or tyranny, whether it's by ideologies, movements, or even a state. That's a point I'd like to expand upon. For many years, perhaps centuries, the rhetoric about church and state has been in terms of a state being independent from the church. But if we look historically at the issue, there is an equally strong and in fact older move to make sure that the church should be independent from the government. If we look at Magna Carta Clause 1, so this is something hundreds of years old, the first clause of Magna Carta affirms the independence of the church by stating, and I quote, In the first place, we have conceded to God, and by this our present charter, for us and our heirs forever, that the English church shall be free, and have her rights entire, and her liberties inviolate, and we wish that it thus be observed. Magna Carta's assertion of the freedom of the Church and the assertion of its independence from the monarchy might seem odd in today's context in which it is more common to reject the Church's influence on the state. Yet as early as 1215, the independence of the Church made it a body that could protect not only its own interests but protect people whose pursuits fell foul of the civil government. Now, Magna Carta didn't impact directly on academic freedom, but what it basically implied was made clear in the founding of Catholic universities. They had their genesis in the movement heralded by Pope Gregory in the 11th century, Pope Gregory asserted the independence of the church from the civil government. 
It declared, for example, that the church, not civil leaders, should select church leaders. The position led ultimately to what we now call the separation of church from the state. But it also meant very importantly the assertion of the freedom of the church from state interference. Now that spirit of independence implies an important role for Catholic universities today. It is part of the university's mission to teach, to research, to learn in a way that frees students and faculty from state interference. In other words, under the protection of the Church, the Catholic University should be a place of refuge from state tyranny. If we want a practical sense of that sort of freedom, let's look to the way that Catholic universities operated in Eastern Europe at the time of Soviet domination. They were some of the very few places where academics could operate with authentic freedom. We might take it for granted that last century the church had the responsibility to protect people from the tyranny of an oppressive state. But even today, even when the state may be more benevolent, we still have that vocation to protect people against external forces, especially those of the state, external forces that would interfere with our pursuit of truth and goodness. In our own time, and from another perspective, Richard Liddy points to the countercultural nature of the university. He argues rightly that academic freedom exists not only for individual faculty members and students, but for the university itself. A Catholic university should be independent and free, and in that way, we should run counter to what he calls the prevailing tendencies of social and cultural decline. And the Catholic University can do this. The Catholic University can be countercultural by being held to more enduring standards of faith, hope, and love. Importantly, I'd like to repeat the point. Most discussions of academic freedom concentrate on the freedoms of individuals. But Liddy points out that universities have freedom as institutions. That is, the university community itself has its freedom as a Catholic university. That is, the freedom to be distinctive in things such as its approach to reason, its foundational values, its faith basis, and ultimate purpose. Liddy's points tie in with an important point made by Jesuit theologian and philosopher Bernard Lonigan. He states somewhat directly that secular universities are inevitably tied to the waxing and waning of civil development and movements. And because a secular university recruits its students and faculty from the prevailing social cultural context of civil society, the secular university is constrained by those same social cultural standards. Having said that, the Catholic university has its own constraints, but these are not only cultural, but countercultural, because a Catholic university is animated by the supernatural virtues of faith, hope, and charity, which orient people not just to their society, but to God. So Liddy and Lonigan tell us that a Catholic university as a community enjoys its own academic freedom, and this is freedom from the contingencies of the world, the trends of the world. We enjoy it because our intellectual horizon is wider, deeper, and higher than that of a secular university. That's a positive view of academic freedom. It's a positive view of the role that Catholic universities have of guarding academic freedom. It raises an important question though of how today's Catholic universities can provide a safe haven 
from things like government interference. Now we could look to how Catholic universities have protected people from authoritarian governments in the past, but it's worth considering that even today, the Catholic University must be a place where contrary viewpoints are entertained and protected. I'd like to put another perspective on all this. Academic freedom should not exist in a vacuum. Freedom should have an object. We can ask, is it freedom with purpose? Freedom for goodness? Freedom for truth? In that light we can ask, are we free to pursue truth, justice, and to pursue the good without interference? Can we pursue freely the good, the true, and the beautiful? Are we free to seek God and to serve the common good? That is what academic freedom means in a Catholic university. And without any shame or embarrassment in saying so, I agree with Pope John Paul II that such freedom can only occur within certain parameters. As mentioned before, John Paul reminded us that academic freedom should exist within the confines of the truth and the common good. Now to clarify the point, the Pope would include the, the integrity of Catholic teaching under the mantle of truth and the common good. Truth and the common good. Words, concepts, ideas we may have taken for granted in past years. But today, we live very much in what has been called a post-truth generation. That term became popular during the 2016 presidential election in the United States. But before then, and even now, I'd argue that we still have the repression of truth, perhaps not so much by governments, but by social movements and ideologies. I mentioned some of them before, but around the world, pressure is put on academics to direct their teaching or research into content and media that suit government priorities. It's against challenges like these that a Catholic university has a special vocation to protect academic freedom. From our confidence in the truth and what is called the font of all truth, our mission is to protect and promote the rigorous pursuit of truth and goodness. That is why for me, academic freedom at a Catholic university is not something to be embarrassed about. Academic freedom at a Catholic university is actually a prophetic freedom in which we can be free of government, social trends or movements. We are free to engage in a relentless pursuit of truth, a deeper truth that is founded upon love, hope and faith. A faith, I would add, that is not just faith in God, but faith in our human ability to know truth, to do good, to know and act responsibly. In short, John Paul II tells us that academic freedom is freedom with a purpose. It is freedom for the truth and in the truth. Likewise, it is freedom for the common good and in the common good. I've mentioned truth in relation to academic freedom, so I might say a little more about what I think truth is, or how we can think of truth today. And to do that, I'd like to refer to the Jesuit philosopher, Father Tom Daly. The way that he would answer Jesting Pilate's question, what is truth? Father Daly stated, truth is that which stands up to persistent questions. That's a good definition of truth. It's useful, and it can be understood just as well by lay people as by professional philosophers. It's also something that bears upon the vocation of a Catholic university. 
It's straightforward for us to understand that persistent questions lead to truth because they ask questions such as, what is something? Is it really so? Is it valuable or lovable? Persistent questions is part of the intellectual DNA of Catholic universities. From a historical perspective, before Catholic universities were founded, learning focused upon going to an authority and listening to the authority give their opinion on a text or a subject. But with the founding of Catholic universities, academic freedom would ensure that the master teachers would debate disputed questions. They would engage their God-given reason and not just authority and through reason, through questioning, through challenge, through the relentless pursuit of persistent questions, truth emerged. And this truth, I would add, gave birth to modern society, modern science, modern culture as we know it. This is something I speak about in another presentation on the Catholic intellectual tradition. Persistent questions. These are things that free us from inauthenticity. They free us from political correctness. They free us from hostile government policies. They free us from vindictive protectiveness. Persistent questions free us from post-truth politics. They encourage ideas rather than repressing them. And persistent questions call for mindful debate rather than mindless violence. Persistent questions free us from the tyranny of political correctness and champion the value of free speech in a healthy society. Persistent questions affirm the God-given dignity of human beings who ask these questions. They ask them because this is how they live out their natures freely as images of God. Towards the end of this presentation, I'm very conscious of a current issue. At home and abroad, many universities have been corrupted by the Chinese Communist Party. We read about this almost every day now. We can just go to Google or, or our favorite search engine and look up University Chinese Communist Party. There's corruption and repression of truth. It's come from things such as Confucius Institutes, money being spent to ensure a pro-Beijing position. It has even come through violence and intimidation. Only recently, a prominent Australian university was warned by the Education Minister Dan Tian about its, and I quote, decision to remove social media posts about the, the erosion of human rights in Hong Kong. The minister had to warn us that universities should prize free speech as a pillar of Australian democracy. Now I'm speaking about one incident there, but that university is hardly alone. I wondered though, why is it that my university and many other Catholic universities have not fallen victim to the same extent to the influence of the Chinese Communist Party? There may be many reasons, some social, some political, but one of them is because academic freedom is in the very intellectual DNA of the Catholic University. And because of this academic freedom, it is the very instinct of a Catholic University to resist attacks on truth by all enemies, foreign or domestic. I'd also argue that it's no accident that we see many threats to academic freedom at secular universities, public universities around the world. But ironically, in our time, academic freedom seems to have been best defended by Catholic universities and faith-based universities that share our core values. Having said all that, some people will still focus upon what they see as a negative. That is, that there are conditions for freedom at a Catholic university. 
But I think that all takes on a different context. If we consider that academic freedom at a Catholic university has its guiding principles, its ultimate goal and aim, and also that even freedom needs boundaries. We could put this into other words. We need a law of academic freedom. And I think the best way of approaching the boundaries of academic freedom is to draw a parallel with two people on the issue of law. If I can quote John Locke, the end of law is not to abolish or restrain, but to preserve and enlarge freedom. For in all the states of created beings capable of laws, where there is no law, there is no freedom. Then there is the definitive word from Charlton Heston playing Moses in the Ten Commandments. There is no freedom without the law. So yes, academic freedom at a Catholic university is subject to the law of truth and to the common good. But as John Locke, Moses, St. Paul and St. John Paul II would tell us, the law of truth and the law of the common good give us the authentic freedom we prize at a Catholic university. This means, as I've said earlier, that academic freedom also means academic responsibility. It's a responsibility, perhaps more than a responsibility. It's a vocation to truth and the common good. And importantly, this academic freedom is important not just to individuals, but to the institution, to the university, as a community of scholars. Before I leave, I'd like to acknowledge first the University of Notre Dame, Australia, my academic home for the past 11 years. I'd like to acknowledge Father Peter Beer, Director of the Sydney Lonigan Centre, Dr John Beer, and the Australian Lonigan Workshop Committee for their support of the research upon which this paper was based. Thank you for watching. Goodbye and God bless. May you always be authentically free.